Red Hulk, or I guess General Thunderbolt Ross, uh, first appeared in Marvel Comics with the Incredible Hulk number one in May of 1962. Of course, he was created, like most people back then, by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. But here's the funny thing. The origins of Thunderbolt Ross, like a lot of characters in Marvel, are just kind of scattered all over the place. Specifically, in The Incredible Hulk number one, uh, Tales to Astonish number 61, and uh, The Incredible Hulk number 291. Now, another thing that kind of goes on here is something called Control. And Control was, a, was something that showed up in Conspiracy number one, which was this interesting line of comics that Marvel did back in 1998 uh, that was made that was done by uh, Dan Abnett. But uh, for this particular purpose, uh, we're going to focus on on those original three issues that, that we had mentioned, right? So the idea of Thunderbolt Ross in terms of his creation at the hands of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby was that much like a lot of the comics back then, Stan Lee did recognize the idea that the Incredible Hulk uh, was kind of like this giant green rage monster. But more so than that, Stan Lee was all about the idea of focusing on the human element of characters in the sense that who are they beyond like what whatever fantastic powers they happen to have. And so where, where Bruce Banner was kind of this, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde-esque character, Stan Lee thought it was really interesting to create a villain that was basically just a man. There was nothing really special about him. He didn't have any kind of superpowers or anything like that. It was just kind of like mankind against like, it's it's almost warring nature, right? It's kind of what, what the Incredible Hulk represented. And so when Thunderbolt Ross was initially introduced to us uh, in the Incredible Hulk number 291, we're given the story that Thunderbolt Ross actually comes from a family of people who were involved in the military. And it was very much a source of pride for, for Thunderbolt Ross to basically join up with what was the Army Air Corps at the time in the 1940s. Eventually that became the Air Force, but the Army Air Corps at the time. And then basically like rose through the ranks exceedingly fast. Now, one of the things that Stan Lee didn't really give us a lot of is whether or not it was based largely on his abilities or on his family history, right? Because uh, I have to believe like most things in the world, the military kind of allows you to move up in the ranks based on your own family history, right? So the stronger your family ties with the military, uh, and the more involved they were, the easier I think it is for you to move up. I don't really have any evidence to support that. I'm not a military man myself, but it's something that I always kind of believed to be true, just based on my own my own work experience. But regardless, during World War II, General Thunderbolt Ross actually moved up to the role of a captain and fought in the Pacific Theater. But one of the big things that came out of Thunderbolt Ross came with regards to a concept called control. And control was given to us as this post-World War II era, I would say kind of think tank slash group. Now, control was basically a hand full of guys, right? So uh, basically military officials that worked on the side of, or really worked alongside Bolivar Trask and looked at the idea of basically trying to stop future crises before they took place. Now, the notion of control itself was actually taken by the federal government and rolled into what would become Project Wide Awake with the rise of the mutant population, right? Of course, that was headed largely by Henry Peter Geirich, but for the most part, control didn't last super long. Uh, it ended up being disbanded, more or less, and of course, the guy who created it, uh, General Edwin Harrison, was kind of thrown away, kind of, you know, black bald as a crazy guy. But the big takeaway from, from Thunderbolt Ross came with the fact that he was stationed at the Los Alamos Research Facility in New Mexico. Of course, most of you guys are familiar with this as the place where Bruce Banner became the Incredible Hulk for the very first time. And the idea behind this was that Thunderbolt Ross had been consistently presented to us as very much in being a kind of prideful man, right? In the sense that his assignment here at the at the, the nuclear research facility kind of pissed him off, right? It, was, it took place before the events of the Korean War and kind of ran through the Korean War and after the Korean War. And because of the fact that he had made, su made such a name for himself in the sense that those under his command had actually given him the nickname Thunderbolt because he just kind of flew in like a strike of lightning, right? His ability to fly jets, different things like that, uh, that it seemed like his entire, entirely decorated military career had kind of fizzled out with him just working a desk job at some research facility somewhere. Now, of course, he also spent time with Brian Banner, but one of the big things that came out of this is that his wife, Karen, had only given him one daughter, Betty Ross, and it died when Betty was in her teens. The other thing behind this is that because Betty Ross had basically been brought over to uh, to Thunderbolt Ross in order to, you know, have a parent to raise her, he actually ended up shuffling her off to a uh, to a boarding school. And then once she became an adult, she ended up coming back. Now, this sort of wraps around and bookends into the Incredible Hulk number one, when you have her encountering Bruce Banner for the first time alongside Thunderbolt Ross. And, and Ross's distaste for Bruce Banner initially started out as something innocuous, something small, because of the fact that Bruce Banner was the one who was running the nuclear project. And it kind of pissed off, uh, pissed off Thunderbolt Ross because in his mind, it was a military project, therefore a military official should be running it. And because of his decorated history, he felt like it should have been him, right? So they, you know, a lot of that pride kind of coming into foray. And the fact that you ended up having uh, Bruce Banner basically pushing, you know, Rick Jones out of the way when the, the the initial gamma bomb was supposed to go off and then being exposed to those and becoming the Incredible Hulk, as we know, it basically laid the groundwork for Thunderbolt Ross to go directly after, uh, after Bruce Banner, trying to figure out what in the world was going on. Now, the other thing that we had going on here was a man by the name of Glenn Talbot, who at the time when he was stationed at 
desert base was basically a security chief and a major. Uh, but of course he would go on to become the husband of Betty Ross and you know, at a future point in time. But as far as Bruce Banner himself and the relationship between him and General Thunderbolt Ross, the other part of Ross's frustration with Banner writing the show is that Banner didn't really live up to how Ross saw him, uh, saw a man should be. That he wasn't really masculine in the way that Ross believed a man should be. This and the fact that Betty was actually becoming attracted to uh, to Bruce Banner, which kind of pissed him off because he always felt like, uh, like Betty should basically marry a military man, effectively led Ross to this place whereby Bruce Banner was essentially everything he stood against, right? And, and in a lot of ways, Banner was just kind of this guy who received this unfair treatment at a man who was really just unhappy with his life. Uh, Thunderbolt Ross, looking back at his career and seeing how it all kind of seemed to coalesce with what was basically a desk job and seemed to kind of take away from all of his great military achievements, along with, you know, Betty Ross becoming attracted to Banner, Banner not quite being the man that, that General Thunderbolt Ross thought he should be, uh, would basically led to Banner becoming just this target, really just this overall vitriol in the fact that General Thunderbolt Ross just didn't really like his life, right? And so when Bruce Banner became the Incredible Hulk, initially, nobody really knew that he was the Hulk except for Rick Jones, right? He was the only person that ever really found out. There did come a point in the old uh, the old Incredible Hulk stories where it was believed that the Hulk was killed, and this led to Rick Jones basically telling uh, Thunderbolt Ross and, and, uh, and Glenn Talbot and Betty Ross who the Incredible Hulk actually was, that it was Banner. And this is what pissed off Ross, because Banner had seemingly gone from this man who was every ounce, you know, kind of a weakling, effectively, you know, kind of a, a coward in the eyes of Ross to a man that basically toppled him, right? The, the, and, and it just, it was like this thorn in his mind that he couldn't quite get out. And so the result was that he became the singular focus for, uh, of Ross's interest, right? Ross tracked him down in almost every conceivable way. And these, this, this kind of early relationship, right? The idea the Incredible Hulk wanted to be left alone, General Thunderbolt Ross constantly tracking him down was a mainstay throughout all of the early Incredible Hulk stories, right? This goes all the way back to the Incredible Hulk number 124. It goes into the Incredible Hulk 145, the Incredible Hulk number 158. And you had these different things that took place whereby you kind of saw these moments where the Hulk might get some bit of a reprieve in the sense that Ross had kind of taken pleasure in the fact that Betty Ross had actually ended up marrying Glenn Talbot. It was always kind of this undertone, right? In the sense that Betty was constantly being lied to by her father and saying, well, all I want to do is cure the Incredible Hulk. The reality is that he wanted to kill him, right? He wanted to kill him, get rid of him, or at the very least, hand him over and, and just kind of like break his body down and have him turn into a super soldier. But there was never really anything altruistic about the desire of, of General Thunderbolt Ross to find the Incredible Hulk. Now, by this point, specifically with the Incredible Hulk issue number 159, Steve Englehart had taken over the title, right? And we talked about the, the you know, some of the importance of his run uh, in our video on the Incredible Hulk Explained. At least I think we did a reworked video. I don't remember if we did an updated video from the original one that we did that was like nine minutes long back when I first started the channel. Uh, but what you ended up getting here in this, this Steve Englehart run that ran between 159 and uh, 171 is you had General Thunderbolt Ross who made a deal with the Abomination. And the Abomination, at least the idea of it, was that it would basically track down uh, the Incredible Hulk and it would capture the Incredible Hulk. But ultimately, of course, we know the Abomination failed. And so this led to Thunderbolt Ross forming a team of Hulkbusters inside Canada. Uh, of course, it was done, you know, with, with permission of Canada's Department H. But with that having happened, this team was basically led uh, by a man by the name of Colonel Jack Ambrewster. Now, Colonel Jack Ambrewster was basically captured alongside the President of the United States and General Thunderbolt Ross uh, by the Soviets. Of course, this story kind of taking place during the Cold War is one of the reasons why you saw that kind of story happening because of the fact that the Cold War was very much a significant thing. And Marvel back during that point in time, running up until about the 80s or so, uh, really kept some pretty strong ties to real world events as they were happening at the time. Right? It's one of the issues of the Cold War is it really permeated every facet of, of American and Soviet and even worldwide culture, everything from, you know, mutually assured destruction stories all the way up to just how like Soviets are a threat, right? Communism, all, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the fact that, that General Thunderbolt Ross had been captured by the Russians was a massive source of embarrassment. Uh, and while he was eventually freed, this led to Talbot being Talbot, uh, captured by the Russians, which of course led Betty Ross to believe that General Talbot had died. And then it kind of pissed her off and pushed her further away from her father. Now, instead of identifying this as a direct result of what uh, General Thunderbolt Ross had done and the fact that his obsession with causing, uh, uh, capturing the Hulk had led him to this place. Instead, like many stories before it, he basically pointed the finger at the Incredible Hulk and said if he didn't exist, none of this would be a problem. And so this was the kind of storytelling that you saw that basically pushed General Thunderbolt Ross further and further in his pursuit of capturing the Hulk. Now, the reality of this is that Steve Englehart had actually left the title before this particular plot thread was wrapped up. And so with issue number 179, Lynn Wine came over the title where he would basically write until issue one, uh, issue 220 and what's probably considered one of the most celebrated Incredible Hulk runs of all time. But the idea here is that Lynn Wine kind of wrapped up these threads in order to sort of make the title his own.
own and then just kind of took off with it from there by and large the the idea of thunderbolt ross for the most part didn't really change and this wasn't really anything to do with with the fact that it was a dislike of thunderbolt ross for lynn wine but more because wine wanted to kind of introduce new concepts right and so that's why you saw like wolverine being bought in when you saw uh, the incredible hulk making his way to canada different things like that uh but for thunderbolt ross himself one of the big things that came out of it is that he was basically reduced to having a nervous breakdown that after being basically removed from the project green skin as it was called uh and and the entirety of the hulkbuster base they didn't that, that ross ended up suffering like a total nervous breakdown now eventually he came under the care of doc samson and that served the purpose of basically saying hey you know look he's he's kind of being sorted out here uh but for the most part between this the the you know capture at the hands of the soviets all these things that kind of led to the fact that he didn't quite feel like the soldier that he once was all led to him fully pushing headlong into the idea that the incredible hulk basically needed to be captured right the incredible hulk needed to not just be captured but to be killed now again a lot of the major plot threads focusing on ross really came with the incredible hulk issue number 262 is when a lot of this stuff started now this really goes into what is considered to be the single most celebrated run or really two runs of the incredible hulk the first one being done by bill mantlo and the second one being done by peter david now we've talked about the significance of these stories in the sense that unlike lynn wine or steve Englehart or even stan lee and jack kirby this kind of notion of the incredible hulk embodying stories with flights of fantasy and things like that were really removed and instead it was focusing largely on the human element of the incredible hulk introducing things like multiple personality disorder the idea that the incredible hulk is a physical manifestation of the abuse that bruce banner suffered at the hands of his father brian banner those were all major plot threads that came with the incredible hulk line of comics as it was written by bill mantlow and built on by peter david but as for general thunderbolt ross himself things actually got really cool for his character and so starting in the three-part story to hunt the hulk the family that dies together and sunset of a samurai uh bill mantlow introduced probably one of the most significant events to happen in the incredible hulk mythos with the death of general talbot and the idea behind this is that with general talbot himself following the nervous breakdown of thunderbolt ross general talbot was the one who was put in charge of gamma base and the idea was that general talbot would effectively use his resources to hunt down the incredible hulk and almost pick up the slack of thunderbolt ross and a lot of this was based on the fact that betty ross had basically already established she was still in love with bruce banner and it actually divorced general talbot and so in the aftermath of this general talbot actually committed treason and then was ultimately killed in battle with the incredible hulk himself and so going into uh the incredible hulk issue number 262 and following the death of talbot that this kind of furthered the idea the intention of of thunderbolt ross to track down the hulk and to take him out and so where general thunderbolt ross couldn't really be given the resources uh to basically hunt down the hulk proper and a lot of this was due to the fact that congress was devoting resources to other things as well as general thunderbolt ross's many failed attempts what the president ended up doing was putting general thunderbolt ross in charge of a think tank that would basically allow general thunderbolt ross to track down the hulk the problem with this is that in issues 278 and 279 this entire plan by the president that was basically formed by thunderbolt ross was essentially destroyed when you ended up having it established that the incredible hulk could maintain his own personalities his own uh intelligence so on and so forth and the fact that banner was basically able to maintain his own identity when he transformed into the hulk this led to the president of the united states basically pardoning the incredible hulk of all of his past offenses and so what you ended up having was general thunderbolt ross who was in charge of something called project earthfall which basically led to him intentionally committing treason by freeing the abomination who had already been uh been held in stasis by the federal government and then working alongside aim managed to pull it off the problem is that of course the abomination was basically defeated by the incredible hulk and then when the hulk forced uh general thunderbolt ross to admit his actions in front of his daughter that this pushed betty even further away and closer into the arms of banner and so what this did was leave thunderbolt ross in a state of complete and total disgrace regarding his historical military career and he basically just kind of ended up becoming a wanderer but for the most part this became one of the most important aspects of thunderbolt ross's character because much like we had seen with the the storytelling of bill mantlo where he focused on the human side of the incredible hulk he did the exact same thing with thunderbolt ross and it was kind of an answer to the question what happens when all of his misdeeds and all the terrible things that he'd done all in an effort to capture the hulk basically came to fruition and so when that when when it all kind of hit the fan he was left as almost kind of a shell of his former self right he had he had already lost his wife at a future at a previous point in time now he's lost his daughter he's effectively lost his career right he seemingly had lost everything one of the big issues though was that despite this work that bill mantlo had put into the incredible hulk uh by the mid 
90s, Jim Shooter had worked out a deal with Mattel in order to create toys for Marvel Comics. The problem is that Mattel wanted an event in order to market these toys, and so Marvel ended up creating Marvel superheroes. The problem is that the work that the that had been done on the Incredible Hulk and even General Thunderbolt Ross and characters like that uh, was kind of wiped away to some degree by Alan Milgram. And depending on who you talk to, some people loved the work he did, others hated it. But the idea of General Thunderbolt Ross is that he had this sort of redemption story in the sense that between uh, the Incredible Hulk issue number 320 running all the way up to issue number 330 in this 10, 11 part series that you ended up having Thunderbolt Ross who basically showed up at the wedding of, uh, of Bruce Banner and Betty Ross and that the intention was to basically stop the wedding from happening. What you ended up getting was the introduction of this kind of living electricity, sentient energy called Zax uh, that had the intention of like trying to destroy, well, you know, doing what villains do. The idea was that Thunderbolt Ross had actually stepped in and basically sacrificed his life to lead to the defeat of Zax. Now, in this sacrifice, this, this kind of redemption story, that Thunderbolt Ross had basically admitted he was wrong about everything with regards to Bruce Banner, that he really was a great guy, that he had to basically trust his daughter, that his daughter knew a great man when she saw him, and that in this last moment, he basically died in the arms of his daughter, right? He died in the arms of, of Betty Ross. And so for the most part, this saw the vanishing of, of General Thunderbolt Ross for quite some time. In fact, for about 30 issues or so, for 36 issues, we didn't really see him. He did come back in uh, The Incredible Hulk issue number 366, but then for the most part, we didn't really see him after that until we got to The Incredible Hulk number 456, at least not really anything of note. He was just part of the military and was just part of, you know, basically there, and that was essentially it. Now, one of the reasons, or at least I, I would kind of have to assume the reason for this was because by that point, we were in the Peter David run starting in the 1990s. And Peter David took a lot of emphasis off of villains that have been around for a long, long time if they didn't really seem to serve a useful purpose to the stories he wanted to tell. And for the most part, didn't, uh, General Thunderbolt Ross didn't really seem to fill that role. I mean, he just did some things, but a lot of stories were based on like the leader or, or, or like Abomination or other characters that we were aware of, or even just kind of building up on the Incredible Hulk mythos itself, kind of involving a lot of other characters that were going around. The other part of this is that when we were getting into the 1990s, we were talking about the comic bus. And so for the most part, there wasn't really a lot of room to tell stories involving characters, villains or otherwise, that really didn't draw a lot of fanfare. And because comics in the 1990s were just super high octane and super fast paced, there wasn't really a whole lot of room to focus on somebody like Thunderbolt Ross, who didn't really have any powers and whose only real ally was the US military that he could use to track down the Hulk. Not when you were standing in the face of like the Abomination, or you were standing in the face of the Leader, or any of these other super powered beings out there that could be used to create just super high intense stories. And so what we ended up getting was basically going into the mid 2000s uh, with the launch of the Incredible Hulk Volume 2. And this basically saw the return of Thunderbolt Ross, but not really the way that we intended. So with Greg Pak taking over the Incredible Hulk line of comics in what's arguably the single most popular run of the Incredible Hulk in the history of the entire character, uh, we ended up seeing a series of events take place, right? Planet Hulk, World War Hulk, different things like that. But the idea was to actually kind of introduce a secondary concept that was basically new, something that we hadn't really seen before. And it, it really kind of happened as a result of two ideas coalescing at the same time. So in an interview with the Washington Post with writer Jeff Loeb, Jeff Loeb had stated the idea for, for Red Hulk kind of indirectly came from him and Ed McGinnis. The fact that Ed McGinnis wanted to draw the Incredible Hulk and that they had kind of had this idea where like the Watcher would show up or something like that and the Incredible Hulk would just get pissed off and punch him. And the reason for that was to establish that the Incredible Hulk truly was the strongest character there was, right? That there would be some story arc that would take place where the Incredible Hulk would basically fight against all the superheroes on Earth and come out on top, right? And basically just kind of show to the reader, yes, the Incredible Hulk is still the strongest guy there. Around that same time, Joe Quesada had actually either come up with the idea himself or used the idea that was pitched in the 1970s with regards to the Incredible Hulk TV show to have a red version of the Hulk that was basically uninhibited, right? It was just kind of a mindless monster uh, that wasn't really, didn't really have to deal with the struggles of like Bruce Banner keeping him in check or anything along those lines. And so these two ideas effectively came together with the Hulk number one. And this was something that kind of came in the aftermath of the World War Hulk event that where Bruce Banner had basically been locked away inside of a prison uh, three miles below the original facility where he was exposed to gamma radiation that a new Hulk book was launched that was basically one of mystery. Now, the funny thing about this is that people had looked at this and I remember going through forums and checking this out. People had looked at this and they'd seen what, that, that it was Jeff Loeb writing it. And a lot of people seemed to be somewhat disillusioned at the outset because they were coming out of Jeff Loeb's Wolverine run, uh, which depending on which fan you talk to was not super well received. But the overall gist is that for quite some time, we never got an answer to who the Red Hulk was. Instead, the Red Hulk just showed up on the scene and then was just attacking various heroes. He was going, or even various characters, right? He was going after Wendigo, right? Just, just characters that were traditionally, you know, villains of the 
uh, of, of the Incredible Hulk. One of the more significant things the Red Hulk did was actually murder the Abomination. And it was really kind of Jeff Loeb and, and uh, Ed McGinnis's way of saying, look, like this guy is not to be trifled with, right? Like the Abomination has given the Incredible Hulk a run for his money multiple times over the years. Now the Red Hulk just killed him. This and the fact that the Red Hulk was shown to be somebody of military strategy, somebody with some great history. Looking in hindsight, the clues were always there, right? But for the most part, we were all kind of wrapped up in the story and not really able to figure out the fact that it was actually Thunderbolt Ross. That and the fact that Thunderbolt Ross had been missing in comics from up to that point, about a 156 issues, really kind of made him sort of out of sight, out of mind. What you end up getting here are some events where like uh, the, the Red Hulk is basically brought together alongside, uh, alongside a bunch of other heroes in a group called the Offenders, which is designed to be the antithesis to the Defenders. Uh, he ended up stealing like the, the cosmic power of the Silver Surfer, took the Silver Surfer surfboard, killed a whole bunch of people. They were pretty, they were pretty wild, right? Pretty nuts and, and, and pretty wild. But while that was going on, the next clue that we got in relation to the nature of the character was Red She-Hulk. And so it was really kind of building and, and brewing and, and going into to multiple things until we ended up getting into the World War Hulk's event, whereby we learn that the Red Hulk is actually Thunderbolt Ross who had been returned. That working alongside the Intelligentsia, which is kind of a criminal think tank organization that's headed by MODOK, that General Thunderbolt Ross had actually worked alongside Bruce Banner and that Bruce Banner was instrumental in the death of Thunderbolt Ross. Now, the whole idea behind this was to basically throw fans off the scent, right? That where fans were slowly starting to pick up on the idea that General Thunderbolt Ross was actually the Red Hulk. This was designed to say, no, he's not either, right? To kind of basically eliminate people who could have been the Red Hulk. That's why, that's one of the reasons why you saw characters like Abomination killed was one part to establish the power of the Red Hulk, but to also say the Red Hulk's not some new version of the Abomination. And so this kind of, this, this sort of pattern happened consistently across the board. But of course, we also ended up learning things like the General Thunderbolt Ross who died was a life model decoy. The revelation that Red Hulk is actually General Thunderbolt Ross. And that's when things changed drastically with Jeff Loeb leaving the Hulk series. And then in turn, Jeff Parker taking over as writer, we actually saw the Red Hulk because of his popularity being rolled over into more stories. And in fact, he actually ends up siding alongside Captain America and then eventually joins the Avengers. You get to the heroic age story in 2010, uh, where you basically end up seeing the hood trying to capture the infinity stones and, and basically a new version of the infinity watch, albeit earth based is formed by Captain America and the Red Hulk actually gets the power stone, right? So you saw these small little little things taking place. One of the bigger things to come out of this, because of the Red Hulk's ability to siphon off energy of other people was one of his mainstays, Marvel shook things up a bit by toying with the idea that it had actually been taken away. But where it was initially restored, this kind of revelation came out of it in saying that the ability of the Red Hulk to siphon the energy of others was actually, quote unquote, killing General Thunderbolt Ross. And so the result of this is that he couldn't transform back into his Thunderbolt Ross form anymore. And it was basically a way for Marvel to kind of get rid of the old hat General Thunderbolt Ross stories to basically tell fans, we're not going back to the age of comics where like the Incredible Hulk's on the run and Thunderbolt Ross is trying to track him down, that Red Hulk is basically here to stay. And it made sense because Red Hulk was just proved to be so popular at that point in time, people loved him and they didn't want him to go anywhere. And so by the time you got into 2012, you ended up getting a kind of uh, a kind of team called the Thunderbolts, which differentiated from the original version that we saw that was led by Baron Helmet Zemo. This one kind of operated of its own accord and included General Thunderbolt Ross as the Red Hulk. The problem with this is that by the time you got into the lead up to the events of Secret Wars, right? Like most of the characters that we saw at that point in time, Marvel was basically phasing things out. And Marvel was kind of, Marvel had this, this sort of giant checklist, right? In the background, not literally, but more metaphorically, which characters stay and which characters go. But at the end of the day, that's just kind of the, the, the bit of a, of a rundown history. Now, if you want more in-depth stuff with regards to, to the Incredible Hulk, at least more in-depth than we went here with regards to the Red Hulk, if you want more in-depth uh, story there, you can actually find the whole Incredible Hulk run by Greg Pak, which includes everything we covered involving the Red Hulk down in the description, right? It's just this massive, great, big, huge series of videos that we made. I want to say it's like nine hours long, right? It's, it's nuts. I think it's the longest full story video that we have. It's crazy how huge it is, but it covers all the Red Hulk stuff. But for an explained video that we usually try to keep under half an hour, uh, we did a pretty good job, I think. <laughs> There's just a lot that happened with the Red Hulk in a really long, in a really short period of time. Uh, but with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end and I will catch you all later. Peace.